show, we are going to talk about the very bad, no good day that was today. We are also going to talk about the two cup matches that uh, came and went. We'll, we'll give our reviews of that. And we will preview the Atalanta Champions League tie, which is in about one week. And for the first time ever on the 1970, Ed is not here. Ed has some life things he has to take care of. And joining me today is sort of newly minted PSG Talk contributor, Ty. Ty, how are we doing today? Doing good, man. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. It's definitely appreciated. I'm looking forward to uh, to getting an opportunity to talk a little football and, uh, you know, see uh, see what your thoughts are and, you know, talk a little bit about the upcoming matches, man. I'm excited. It's going to be a well, good, uh, good couple of days of football coming up. Oh, it will be, maybe. I'm, I definitely have some thoughts, but um, just for our audience, I don't know if you, I've, I think you've done PSG talking before, but just in case there's uh, there's some crossover here, or there isn't some crossover, just a quick little bio of yourself, Ty, and uh, we'll get started from there. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, nothing too interesting, um, you know, currently located in South Florida, Miami to be, be specific, and um I joined the team relatively recently, about a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had been in touch with Ed and I've been on a couple podcasts, you know, here and there and really just someone who enjoys, you know, talking football with people, man. And, you know, whenever I get a chance to uh, to open a beer or get together with friends and, you know, talk shop or, you know, talk football, it's always appreciated. So um, it only made sense that I, you know, kind of team up with you guys being the only English speaking PSG platform that I at least know of. Um, and it's just an opportunity to bond with friends, man, meet new friends, make, make friends and, and talk, you know, about the things that we love, which is PSG. Well, I'm glad to have you on. Um, it's good to have more, as many contributors as we can, ones that are knowledgeable and can have good long form conversations about Paris Saint-Germain. Um, speaking of alcohol, I guess we could talk about today's show being sponsored by Molson. (laughs) Good old Canadian beer. Good. It's good beer, it really is. Um, all right, so today, PSG played So Show in a 80-minute friendly that was just sort of a way to get some guys some minutes, and we got to see some of the younger uh, PSG players, some of the uh, under-19, Javi Simons, Edouard Michaud, that six foot one, 15 15-year-old kid, um, Kai's Ruiz. So before we kind of get into the meat of the show, any kind of thoughts on seeing some of those younger players, any of them stand out today, you know, just so we don't miss it at the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, for me particularly, I think, um, you know, Kai's Ruiz is definitely, um, definitely always looks good when he plays. Um, I think he's definitely impressing, uh, Tuchel. I think that's why he's been getting the minutes. Um, you know, definitely an exciting prospect. He looks ready. Um, you know, Javi Simmons and Musho as well looked really well today. I know a lot of PSG fans were excited to to see them kind of, you know, step on the pitch today in a PSG jersey. I thought Javi had some really good moments. I thought that there was that really good sequence where um, he got on the ball. He threw the through ball down the, the right flank there. Um, the cross came in. Then Musho kind of had like a one-two touch on it, you know, some, some nifty dribbling to kind of get out of trouble right there. So it just shows you, like, these guys definitely aren't nervous. They're not scared. Um, and one of the commentators made a great point. He was just like, you know, these guys have been playing at, you know, a high level for a long time. They're not afraid of the big time. And I think, you know, this is going to be the year that we see them get, reg- I wouldn't say regular minutes, but definitely make some appearances. I think as it stands right now, Kays Ruiz, I think, is, I know you mentioned you think Michaud is that guy, but I think just the way he's been handled with the coaching staff and, you know, Tuchel and the amount of minutes he's get he's getting right now, I think Kays Ruiz is in that lead position to probably see the most time. Um, you know, things obviously could change, um, you know, but that's kind of how I see it now. But it's always good to see, you know, the, the youth products come up and get some playing time and playing alongside some of the older guys. Yeah, I like Kays Ruiz. He's solid. He he. He, make, he, he makes more runs into the box than somebody like a Michaud. But I, I think what I liked about Michaud is that he he seems to just be confident as a midfielder. And I think it's hard to, you know, to be that young and to be sort of sure of himself. I think positionally he understood where he needed to be. 
I didn't think he was ever caught out. And the times where he was able to get forward, it just looked like he had good control. Like, I'm not looking for, you know, I'm not looking to be blown away by a 17-year-old midfielder because it's a hard position to play. And you don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know and you have to get that game experience. And I think if you have guys like Kays Ruiz and, and Michelle getting minutes once in a while during the year, not often, but once in a while, that's a good, um, that's a good deal. Cause you want to build that depth in your, uh, in your youth system. And you want those guys to get as many experiences as possible, because then if they don't, they just sort of end up being on the under 19s. And once you get like to be 19, 20 and you haven't gotten first team minutes at that point, you're starting to think about getting loaned out. And I don't think any of these guys are anybody that we would think of loaning out, you know, sort of as a last resort. I think these are players that could end up in the rotation at some point in the next two, three years. Uh, Javi Simon's interesting, didn't do too much, but the, you know, the stuff that he did was good. Um, I'm curious to see positionally where he ends up, because if you are under the impression that Neymar is going to be here for another three, four years, which I think is looking more likely. Um, I don't know if Xavi's, I'm not sure exactly where he fits positionally in that. Cause Neymar is basically the off the left wing cuts inside guy. So, you know, we'll see. I think it'd be interesting to see those two play together at one point, you know, just for the, just for sort of the sake of it. Like it would be, it would be kind of cool, but, uh, yeah, I, I thought those guys were interesting. I think it's good to see him once in a while, and it was probably the only interesting thing about that game. Yeah, no, I think I, I definitely agree. And, um, you know, I don't know how many people know this, but, you know, Xavi and Kays, they they both are Barcelona youth products that, that, that came over um, and joined PSG. So these guys are talented, man. They've been, um, they've been spotted at a very young age. I know Javi is, I think, 17. I think yeah, Kays is... Yeah, both Yeah, I want to say they're both 17. Um, and yeah, listen, you know, anyone that's, you know, wants to, you know, see, you know, these amazing things, yes, obviously as fans we want that, but we have to be realistic. You know, I think some people see, like, individuals like Ansu Fati and, you know, I think he's, what, 18, 19, um, you know, and what he's doing and the minutes he's getting... These individuals will get there. It's very tough to get into the PSG squad. Um, and this is the first step. I mean, last year, I think individuals thought they, they should have seen Xavi Simmons kind of get some um, some time. You know, time will come. And this was that first step. You know, this was their first chance to, you know, get playing time with Tuchel on the sidelines, kind of giving them instructions. And, um, you know, I can't make any concrete yeah. promises, but I think we can both say that we will expect to see them you know, in the rotation, you know, in the next month or two, you know, I mean, I think we forget also with Champions League being the main priority that the new season starts in a month, you know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, we will get a lot of time to see them and, and hopefully it's good things and there will be ups and downs, you know, uh, young oh, yeah. players are, are inconsistent. I think we see that with Calamendo, you know, I think he had his first game where he, he got the goal and he played really well. And since then he's, he looks good, but he has had up and down moments and that's what we can expect. Yeah, and that's the thing with PSG, and that's the trap that I think some of these youth players fall into, which is that there's a high expectation that PSG wins nearly every match. So when you have that sort of high level of expectation and you put youth players in there, they're going to struggle, and there's going to be times where it's going to cost you games. So there is that sort of that put that uh, push and pull between, you know, hey, we want to get these guys minutes, and we want to see if they can, you know, develop and we need to win these matches. So there's a, there is that issue. And I think it's, it's hurt PSG youth players in the past. There's some that just haven't been able to sort of overcome it. I think um, guys like John Kevin Augustin, for example, um, I think he's maybe one of the better examples. Odson Edward, same kind of idea. You get these young guys, they just, they're, they're not going to get the minutes. I think, maybe PSG is starting to learn their lesson about that. And now they have to sort of figure out what that balance is, but we're going to maybe need these guys. Cause apparently the whole team is going down injured right? <laughs> you know, right as we need them. So let's get into the bad stuff. So today we learned, you know, sort of out of one of those, you know, classic out of the blue, out of nowhere, PSG bad news situations 
That just that blew up PSG Twitter at one point. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I think it was a bad report, and I'll explain why. But um, Marco Verratti gets injured in training. The official word is a uh, the the way that the the way that they describe injuries in French is sort of weird to me. But I think what I got out of that whole gobbledygook was that it was a a calf bruise, say like a fairly deep calf calf bruise. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that I think it's fair. And I I do think also, and one thing that always throws me off is whenever you're reading. Um, injury reports in French, it always says, you know, a muscular lesion. You know, when I think lesion, I think some type of cut or tear. Um, but now I'm learning. But yeah, it, that's, it seems like it was some type of either calf pull or calf bruise, some type of collision. Um, that's what I got out of it. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of where, I think you're in the same spot. Yeah, and there's video of it. It looks like the Chupa Moting and Varadi banged legs and then Verratti sort of stepped on it and got, you know, and, and pulled up a bit. So, it, you know, it, we'll see. I, I think the, the issue with the, with the reporting of that is that I think when you say that it's, you know, a, like what did I say, it was like, it was pretty much that he was going to miss the game. I don't think that PSG is at that point where they're willing to say that he's going to miss the game. So I think when you report that, it sort of makes it more concrete than it actually is. I think this is more of a murky situation than anything else. I think it's more of, let's wait a few days. Let's see if it, the swelling and the bruising goes down. See if he can walk on it. See if he can run on it. And they'll make a judgment from there. I think it was just premature to say that he was out. And I think, you know, time will tell. It's if if it was something really bad, they would have just said, you know, in the report, like something worse than a than a calf bruise. But you know, it, it's what we always have. It's what always seems to happen. And I think PSG fans in general feel like if they had, you know, if they didn't have bad luck, they'd have no luck at all. And this just seems to happen. It happened with Mbappe just two weeks ago. It's happened before pretty much every major Champions League match that they've had, that there's some sort of injury that happens to a key player. And it's always like a mystery whether they're going to play or not. And, you know, nine times out of ten, they usually don't. And then PSG usually lose. And then it's, you know, and then it's just, it, it, there's a lot of that sort of history going on here as sort of a that puts this all in context. But I mean, what I didn't like, and I'll, I want to get your thoughts on this to maybe balance out what I'm about to say, because I'm kind of happy you're here because you can kind of balance it because I'm going to maybe go a little negative and dark here. But <laughs> I, th- I thought I thought today was a disaster. I thought Thomas Tuchel was an absolute disaster today. I think when you're the coach of a team like Paris Saint-Germain and you know the history and you know how this fan base reacts and you know that the media that you're talking to is against you. And it's pretty clear that unlike in other countries, most of the media in France is hostile to PSG. That's just how it is. Like the keep is hostile. They're, They're all sort of, they're not going to give PSG the benefit of the doubt. Well, I'll put it like that. So to go out there and say things like, you know, I'm really worried about Marco Verratti's health. And, you know, when talking about the Champions League and going, you know, what, we're just going to go out there and we're going to try hard and we'll see what happens. We, we, you know, sort of trying to downplay it, sort of trying to tamper down expectations and then, you know, doing the old, oh, you know, and he said this in an actual press conference with reporters. He said, hey, you know, during, it, it's the Champions League. We're bound to have injuries. He said something like that, where it's like, we're bound to have injuries somewhere. Or there's usually an injury that happens. And it's like, that's okay for the fans to say. The fans can say that. The coach does not say that. And the coach can't go up to the podium nervous and sullen and, you know, basically acting as if he's trying to make the excuses beforehand. And then you have Leonardo going, you know, talking to the media for 30 minutes off the record, basically saying things like, 
oh, you know, the French schedule, they ended the season early and they shouldn't have done that. And, you know, we've had to ramp up our training and it's hasn't been beneficial to us. And, you know, we're, we're, you're starting to see the, the soft peddling of the excuses. You're starting to see that in a situation where they should absolutely not be doing that. There is no reason to sort of, this isn't like when two years ago they were down to Real Madrid 3-1 and they, you know, sort of, they went with the whole, hey, we probably don't have much of a chance to win, but if the fans show up and chant really loudly, we may have a chance after all. So, it, you know, they try to put it on the fans. Now it just seems like PSG are hedging a bit and sort of saying, well, if we lose, then there's a reason we lost. And it's okay. We don't have to blow everything up and you don't have to fire me because I have I have an excuse. That's what I felt like Tomas Tuchel was doing. And I think that's weaselly. I think that's embarrassing. I think as the leader of a of a team, you should be putting on the most optimistic face you can, especially when you do have a player like a Leandro Paredes who can come in and show that, you know, when Marco Verratti was out, that he could, like, contribute and dominate a game. Like, you saw him in that Dortmund match. He was excellent. So to, like, go and, you know, talk about saying, I'm really worried about Marco Verratti, that's not what you say. What you say is, you know, Marco got hurt, maybe got hurt. We'll see what happens. But even if he's out, we have capable people that can come in and do the job. And I have full faith that Leandro Paredes or Idris Gay or Marquinhos can step into the midfield. That's what you say. And then when you talk about the Champions League, you don't say, oh, well, you know, we'll go out there and we'll give it our all and we'll see what happens. No, you go. I'm really confident in this group. I think this group can overcome any level of adversity and can win this thing. That's what you say. And too many times, once again, it's Tuchel with his big mouth saying things that, you know, it's like when the, it's like when the president says something stupid and it shocks the stock market and it drops 500 points. Mm. That's what he does. He does that all the time. He, he did it a lot more last year, but this is a really bad time to do it. And it wasn't necessary. It did, he didn't have to be negative in that situation. And he just, with too many times, he just says things. And it doesn't make sense for him to say these things. You don't have to tell the media the truth. You can tell them lies. You can tell them half-truths in that situation. You don't have to say that, oh, I'm really worried. You can say, Marco Verratti's hurt. Next man up. I, I just really thought we were past this. I really thought we were past this, and that we had fi that PSG had figured out that this was not the route to go down anymore. But we're back to this again. We're back to sort of the excuse making, and all that does is it gives the media more of an opportunity to just pick at the team, pick at it, pick at it. And then, you know, thankfully, they're not at home where the fans would get, you know, nervous and stuff. So they're at their they'll be focused. I don't think it's going to affect them too much on the field necessarily. I just think it's a dumb thing to do. And I think as a coach, you're also partly a, you know, a press secretary. Your job is to sort of keep the fan base hopeful. It's to it's to engender confidence. And I think that. Thomas Tuchel did the opposite of that tonight. I know yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I know that's no, a lot. No, no, no. It's not even a lot. And, you know, I think you mentioned, you know, maybe you'll balance it out. Um, it won't get too too much brighter on my end. Um, one thing I will say is I don't think I'm as tough on Tuchel as, as you have been in the past. Um, I think I am a Tuchel fan. Now, there are decisions that he makes that I disagree with, but, you know, no coach is perfect. But in this situation specifically um, – I agree for the for the most part. There are, you know, a couple of things. Um, you know, I think he dropped the ball a little bit. I think this was an opportunity for him to say exactly kind of what you said. And that's actually exactly what I said in my head when I read the article. I didn't see the press conference. I didn't see what Le uh, Leonardo said. I just literally read uh, the translation of some of the questions and, and what his answer was. But it was a great opportunity for him to strictly just say, hey, listen, he's not out as of right now. 
You know, um, that's not where we're at right now. He had a minor knock in, in practice. He's day to day. And, you know, we're going to monitor it. He wants to play. We want him to play. And, you know, if he's not able to play, we have individuals like, you know, Ghana Gay. We have individuals like Paredes. And it was an opportunity for him not only to downplay the story and kind of calm the, the waves a little bit, but it was also an opportunity for him to boost the confidence of those individual players to be like, hey, my coach has my back. And, you know, Listen, I'm not a professional athlete, but you don't know what that's like for your coach to speak about you at a press conference, especially maybe not for Neymar and Mbappe when you were uh, when you are, um, you know, a star already. But someone for Leandro, who is, you know, hasn't gotten maybe the minutes that he feels he deserves. Someone that recently has been playing well. You know, that's an injection of confidence that potentially can go a long way. So I definitely saw some of the whininess at first. I didn't know his comment about like the champions league and injuries. I, I didn't, obviously I'm going off translation, so I couldn't tell the context if he just meant it as, um, Hey, like this is the champions leagues or the champions league. People get injured. You know what I mean? Or if it was like, Oh no, this is the champions league. PSG always gets injured. Uh, obviously I didn't see the video, so I didn't hear his tone. So it was kind of hard for me to judge, you know, gauge how he meant that. But from their reaction, you're not the only one. I read a lot of reactions and a lot of people weren't happy. Um, a lot of individuals, you know, I, I saw one um, tweet where someone said, you know, when we were sold Tuchel as a coach, we were sold this individual who has a strong personality, who is um, a tactician, who is, you know, stands up for his team and is bold and is courageous and all this all this stuff. And they were just like, you know, that's not what I've seen, um, you know, in his press conferences. And, you know, on the flip side, I think for Tuchel, you know, just playing devil's advocate, you know, PSG is probably one of, if not the toughest coaching job in the world um you know you have this abundance of money um you have all this stuff you win your league super easily the, the league is usually won by you know early in the year april march it's over maybe even sometimes january it's over depending on you know the the, the year we're having and then we have the injuries and nothing ever seems like it's enough. And I think we saw that in his outburst last week when they won the cup final, you know, one nil or in penalties, they said, Oh, you know, they didn't even say congratulations. It was just like the media were just like, Hey, listen, you know, now you've gone, you know, 120 minutes or 150 minutes without, you know, scoring, you know, it took a penalty and this, and he was like, guys, like, what is it? Like we, we just won the domestic treble, and yet I haven't heard of congratulations. It's never you did a good job. There can be 90 good things. And it's always you pick out the one. Every time I, I stand at this podium, it's the one bad thing. So I think it's just a lot of pressure. And obviously, listen, he gets paid millions of dollars. So he needs to learn how to handle it better. But I think it's just it's just a buildup. You know what I mean? And I think I think he was doing better. And I think these last two matches, I think he's just feeling the pressure. Um, you know what I mean? And and obviously, there that excuse always was there, right? That, hey, we didn't play a season um we didn't do x y and z like for him leandro that was always going to be there and and now he's starting to kind of like you said kind of fluff that pillow a little bit to kind of prepare us but it's no excuse listen the game has to be played um they're missing players they're missing probably their best striker their goalie's potentially injured who looks like he's going to play but could be a doubt um and listen we've played without Verratti before and we have won games we've played without neymar Verratti, and um Mbappe and beat Real Madrid so you know it's capable PSG on their day when everyone is clicking um can be anybody and he could have taken a different route you know at the end of the day that's I don't want to beat it a dead horse here but no he, it's yeah he kind of dropped the ball for sure this is the 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 problem with this though is that it's always excuses that's that's mm -hmm. sort of I think where he doesn't read the room like he doesn't understand that part of PSG's real problem over the years is that there always does there always seems to be an excuse that allows us to sort of cope. And I guess as fans, we should have excuses as a way for our coping mechanism. Because as a fan, you never really want to admit that the other team was better than you or that your team failed. You'd rather sort of deflect it into something else that you can sort of justify. But as the coach of the team, you don't have that luxury. But you don't have the luxury of going, hey, you know, we have all this adversity. You know, don't expect too much from us, guys. And if we lose, you know, don't fire me. I feel like that was the tone of that. Where it's like... Yeah, I guess. 
it's a bit of that and it's not all of that but it's a bit it's enough of it where you just have to say when is enough enough when is it a self-fulfilling prophecy like other teams get injuries you know we're not the only team that gets major injuries like it uh, happens i don't all, know it you know what it feels like it is you know it feels like we're snake bit i understand that but i i understand teams, what you're saying I understand what you're saying. Get, yeah, I know. Other teams get injuries. And it can't be, oh, we lost this guy. You know, hey, we lost, but it's okay because we didn't have all of our guys. Like, PSG still have to go out there and beat Atalanta. Like, they uh, they just do. Like, this isn't – it's still a golden opportunity. If you beat Atalanta, there's a really good chance that you'll have Mbappe and Verratti back for that semifinal. You may still have them in the quarterfinal match. But, you know, you, you have to look at it that way. Like, you have to look at it like – we just have to get through Atalanta, play this game, beat them, and then you get your stars back at 100% or close to 100%. Because I doubt this keeps Ferrati out for more than – Yeah, I don't think it's going to keep him out for two weeks. I, I Again, I might be wrong. I might slip on a banana, might slip on a banana peel and he's out for a month. I don't know. But – Yeah, muscle injuries are tough, and I think – listen, injuries are not um, – PSG are still the favorites, and the and the reason you have to go win is because not only have you invested a lot of money, but even with Alvarado, okay, even put Paredes in there, even put Draxler in there. I mean, on paper, you know, I think PSG maybe without okay Di Maria, no Mbappe, no Verratti. You're starting to you start to check off the too many of those guys, and it does become a problem. No, uh, of course, exactly. But but you, you're we're still in a good place from a positional standpoint and a roster standpoint where we can compete. And at the end of the day, in a one-legged tie, 90 minutes, all you need is the ability to compete. That's it. And when you have Neymar on the field, anything can happen. And it's the same way they say it with Messi, right? You have Messi on the field, anything can happen. Why? Well, I, I personally, I feel the same way about Neymar. I mean, when he's on the field, all you need is one moment of brilliance across 90 minutes and I, I feel like he can produce that and I feel like there are enough individuals around him to get the job done. Leandro Paredes yeah. is no chump. You still have Marquinhos, you still have Silva, you still have Kempembe, um Julian Draxler, you know, you're Maybe. that's someone that you that's someone that you like and this is an opportunity I, I, if he yeah, gets minutes to that, to show that, improve. I think that train's left the station though. <laughs> yeah, but I, you I, know I, what? I think that train's left the But you know Bernat looked good. I have to say, Bernat looked like he's healthy. He looks fine. He looks ready to go. Listen, man, it's if one game. Bernat, if they can get Bernat back, that, I, I don't think that out. You know, I don't think that uh, sort of counters losing Verratti. But having Bernat will help. Having Tilo Kerr out at right back will help. They'll we'll get into the preview later, but I think they'll be able to play good enough defense to keep it close and to see if they can, you know, squeak it out. So yeah. I'm not I'm not totally thrown in the towel here. Believe me. My I'm last. Still... Go ahead. I apologize. No, no, it's fine. I was just saying I'm not throwing in the towel on this by any stretch. I think PSG has shown that they can defend and they can defend with quality. And I think they'll sort of play more defensively without those guys on the field. And if they can sort of get a moment of brilliance or get Mbappe on for 25 minutes at the end of the match or like I think there's there's reasons to not be in total panic, but again, it just doesn't help that the coach, you know, feels the need to sort of justify why he might not win the match. I I I just that that always rubs me the wrong way. It's the same thing he did in in that you know last you know January of 2019, which feels like 30 years ago, but when he, you know, was complaining about not having guys and having a, a low roster and he was trying to, you know, he was complaining about, you know, Henrique to the, to the media. And it's just, it, I don't like that. I think I, I don't like when a coach, I don't even like when Mourinho d- did it, where it's like your job as a coach is not to try to deflect the, to deflect the pressure. It's to take the pressure into yourself. That's part of being a coach. You have to take the pressure on so that your players don't have to. And when you deflect the pressure away from you, that pressure has to go somewhere. It doesn't just it, it doesn't just you know go into the ether. It has to it has to go to the players. It has to go somewhere. So yeah, I I won't try to beat that dead horse either. I think it's pretty clear he made a mistake. Hopefully it's not too bad. Hopefully they can get one of 
Mbappe and Verratti back, and we'll we'll preview Atalanta a little later on. But let's sort of talk about the cup matches, and we'll do Saint Etienne first because that's the first one that we played. Um, one nil victory at the Stade de France in what was a really bad football match. Like, there's no really other way to put it. Like, Saint Etienne was pretty much out there to maim and to injure and to try to knock PSG out of their game and win on some sort of fluke. It didn't seem like they were out there to sort of play a game of football that was representative of the best of what football can be. It seemed to be a highly cynical version of, you know, survival football, you know, street football. I don't know what you want to call it. You know, obviously uh, the moment of that game was the Loic Peron assault on Kylian Mbappe's legs, which nearly broke Kylian Mbappe's leg. Luckily it didn't. He's already back on the training ground, you know, doing training without the ball. So, it, you know, he's not, he ain't dead. So it, it ended up not being the worst injury in the world, but it very well could have been. And I, I, I don't know what to take from that game, except for once they once that Mbappe situation happened, the game just sort of ground to a halt and it wasn't much of one. But hey, before, you know, before that happened, I thought PSG looked really good and Mbappe looked really good and they looked like they were making good passes, they had good exchanges. They were pinning Saint Etienne back. They were countering well. So, you know, until that, injury happened hey it was a game it was, you know PSG looked like a they looked like the well-oiled machine that they looked like in the the first three uh exhibition matches so let's get your thoughts on what that sent at the match was yeah I think um for the most part I agree um it was physical it was definitely a physical game it was it was what you would expect from a cup tie especially in France uh, it's you know very physical league. Now, the Mbappe injury definitely right put a spotlight on the game from that standpoint. And I think as PSG fans, you know that happened relatively early. And right after that, for the rest of the game, my mind was kind of elsewhere for the for the majority of the game. Like, how bad is it? You know, and obviously, like like you mentioned, right? That it's the PSG snake bite. It's you know um, here here we go again and all that stuff. So my mind was kind of elsewhere. But I thought we looked good, man. I thought. Um, we do struggle against the low block sometimes. Um, you know, we we are unable to create chances. Um, a lot of yellow cards, a lot of red cards. But I thought, you know, outside of that, I think, you know, the goalkeeper had an absolutely amazing game. I think yeah, that game could have been 3-2-0, you know, relatively early on. But I thought we gave up some chances as well. Um, I did see some of the chances that we gave up in the OL game as well. And this is one of the concerns we'll preview it later, but is our, our set piece defending um, really gives yeah. me nightmares. Sometimes it gives me nightmares. And I think specifically within set piece defending is defending the back post seems to always be a problem. Um, I feel like, you know, if a team watches that and someone is in the right place and just sneaks to that back post, there's never anyone truly, um, you know, watching that. And I think that is something that we definitely need to correct ASAP because Atalanta, you know, that is something that they are very good at is set pieces. Um, yeah. But, you know, Di Maria had a couple of chances that, you know, I thought he should have put away. I'm not on him for it. Um, you know, there was a couple of times I thought he could have did better, but also the goalie was just playing absolutely out of his mind. Yeah. Um, Ruff, there was Ruffy that one where he almost... Yeah, there was the one take where, you know, Di Maria caught it off the volley and, you know, Buddy, you know, got one hand on it. I couldn't even I don't even know how he saved that, to be honest. I was complete in shock. I thought that that was a beautiful ball over the top by Neymar. I was like, all right, Di Maria's going to put this away Two nil second half. Let's let's get out of here. Let's get our, our stars off. But um, we just couldn't break them down. And I think it has to be quite worrisome a little bit. I wouldn't say quite, but I would say a little worrisome, you know. You're PSG, you have Di Marie on the pitch, you have Neymar on the pitch, and, you know, you're up, they're down to 10 men, and you couldn't get another goal to kind of to kind of see that out. Um, that's frustrating, you know what I mean? And obviously that's going to cause a stir amongst PSG fans. We're PSG, we should be, you know, getting, you know, additional goals and stuff like that. But for the most part, listen, at the end of the day, it's a cup match, there's hardware on the line, we won the hardware, you left, you know, you know with, with hardware in hand, Um but it was always going to be overshadowed by the injury at the end of the day, you know, but you know, yeah, another uh, trophy, I, I, another more confidence. 
I agree with that. I, I think that it the win is what matters. I think PSG probably could have won that match three to four nil if if Ruffier wasn't playing so well. But I I just you know it was frust that was a, a frustrating injury. And I think what was really frustrating about it is that it seems like this just happens all the time in France. And it's terrible. It, feels, it it is. It's like this has been legislated out of most soccer leagues. It just doesn't happen. Like, you know, it happens in like Brazil and Uruguay and, and Argentina. That's where you'll see this sometimes where a guy just decides I'm going to go in on this tackle, you know, fuck whoever I'm, you know, I'm tackling. I don't care. You know, it, you'll see that in sort of those leagues. You don't see it in Europe. You don't see it in England. You don't see it in Italy. You don't see it in, in Germany at all. You never see it in Spain. And in France, it just seems like it's not that, you know, of course, they gave him a red card. There's not much more they can do. But it just seems like it's a culture of tacit acceptance of, the, of things like this, where it's like, oh, well, the guy just did what he had to do to get the ball. And it's like, no. The guy didn't do what he had to do to get the ball. The guy jumped and knocked and almost broke the guy's leg. Like, this isn't, you know, don't try to make it any more noble than it actually is. It's not noble at all. It's a guy who's less talented than the person he's defending, and he has no other recourse but to do that. You know what I mean? Like, there's a reason these defenders will make that play as opposed to staying in front or actually, you know, like getting the ball or getting to the ball. Like, in, and in France, and I've talked about this before, I won't harp on it, but it's like, it seems like French referees have decided that we need to give the less talented team, you know, sort of a, a chance in the game by allowing them to do more damage physically. But, you know, in the end, it, I think it did expose a certain level of struggle once Killian came out, and I think it sort of extended to the OL match which I thought was a much better game. I think those two, t I think OL and PSG were fairly even for 120 minutes. I don't think there was much separating those two teams. I mean, if Mbappe plays, I think PSG are that much, are a lot better than OL, but take Mbappe out and it evens the playing field a little bit. It's just, they don't have a player. Obviously there's no one like Kylian Mbappe in the world, but they, they desperately need a guy to back him up that can run off the channels that can, that can get behind defenses. And like Cavani could do that a little because he was doing it when Zlatan was here and Zlatan was the, the nine, like Cavani would run off the run off the shoulder and he'd, and he'd get, he'd give you some width. And without Mbappe giving you that width and those runs, for, you know, that he, that really he can make and nobody else on the team can, it, it changes what PSG is able to do offensively. It limits what they can do, and it forces Neymar to do more than he needs to. Like, it forces Neymar to be have to be so much better. And it also makes Icardi less effective when he doesn't have the ball constantly being put into the box. Like, you saw it against Stowell. Icardi just, he's not effective when... PSG have to play from the outside and they have to try to finesse their way in. Like he's, he's really good when PSG can get the ball behind the defense and then he can make that trailing run behind Neymar and Mbappe. And he kind of picks up the scraps at the back post. Does, yeah. Yeah. Which is what he does really well, but what he doesn't do well is sort of create his own offense and he can't, um, he can't, really do he can't really make those same kind of runs that Mbappe does and that's not his fault he's not that kind of player you've got a guy like Icardi because you can play him with more talented you know players you know on his wings that's what he's there to do he's there to clean up he's there to be the number three and he's a damn good number three but I don't think you can expect him to be as effective when um Killian's not there. And you saw when they took him out, I thought PSG actually got more effective because it what they were able to do is sort of mix up their runs. Neymar would make a run. Sarabia would make a run. Di Maria would make a run. They were able to sort of change it up a little bit and give them a little bit more of a false nine look, which I thought opened the on up a little bit more. 
but you know they're gonna have to play a cardi in the in the atlanta match so it's you know they're gonna have to figure out a way to do this so yeah i think yeah i mean talk yeah. about the ol because i thought the ol match was really good i thought that both teams played well you know psg are limited without mbappe offensively but i think they did about what they could and um it came down to a shootout i mean it was as even as you could get until the end yeah no i think you hit the nail on the head with that one i think the ol match was a lot better from just a structural standpoint the way we played the cohesiveness of the team um but it was a defensive battle at the end of the day um that match I'm okay with, you know, I'm, I'm okay with suffering like that, right? Like yeah, getting a cup and suffering like that, because at that point, the way I see it is, okay, we're, we're going into the champions league, won a cup game. It wasn't an ugly win. It was kind of like one of those grinded out, like, Hey, both teams are playing decently well. It's a defensive battle. And I think you need that. Sometimes PSG needs to suffer a little bit to gain that, you know, excuse me, that, that confidence from a defensive standpoint, which they're going to need. And I think, where it changes us specifically with Mbappe not being on the field is not only the width, but it's it's the ability for the back line of the team we're playing to be able to kind of inch up a little bit higher and press us and squeeze us a little bit. And, you know, I think that that is a problem. For example, you know, we're going to talk, we'll talk about it later, but with Atalanta, they like to play, you know, a high back line. And when you have Mbappe on the field, they're, they're kind of forced to stay back a little bit because they have to respect it. Without him there, there's really no one to respect at that point right and like Neymar and Mbappe I mean Icardi is not he's not super fast um and the Icardi thing is a little bit of a concern to me because it's we have to play him but he's not getting the service I mean listen at the end of the day you have a striker a, a true number nine that's there or a poacher and he only touches the ball eight times in a cup match I mean that's kind of concerning it's and then also does he provide the same defensive work rate that someone like Cavani provided you know I don't know there was one time I think it was Neymar he came down the left the left flank and he had gotten a steal or someone played him a ball maybe it was Di Maria and he had gotten some free space and he put a ball across the box and Icardi was just like nowhere to be found it was just like he picked up his run super late it was just like he's kind of behind yeah and he's kind of just like lackadaisical with it um I don't know what's going on there you know with, with, with him and and Tuchel because Apparently Tuchel is not only Tuchel didn't want him in the first place. That could be just lingering animosity from what happened last season. But um, Icardi doesn't look to be in super shape. I mean, he doesn't look as in, as in shape, at least as in shape that he was when he first joined PSG, um, and he was just scoring goals for fun. Um, and I, I don't know, his the work rate is just different. He's just a different profile, and it's not a it's not bad different. He's just a different profile than what Cavani was, and. And that means you do need certain individuals and a certain system to make him effective. And without Mbappe there, um, it definitely it definitely changes it. It, it well, changes yeah. it, and we're going to have to get creative. But overall, though, you know, just to keep it sh- short, um, I thought it was a good game, um, an, uh, an ugly, grinded-out kind of game. Um, I'm happy with the way we played, but we definitely got to figure out a, a, another way to unlock these defenses without Mbappe there. Um, yeah. You know that's what I mean? the key. And, and to talk about Icardi, I think the 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 is he in shape thing is sort of a it's not nothing, but I think it's not the main issue. Yeah, I'm not I I'm not overblowing it, no, but I it's you, you, I, you I can think see it though. Do, though. I think people you can see do, it though. Or, yeah, you can see it's visible, but you know, like I I think he's still probably in good cardio shape. I think the the issue really is that he needs to have people around him that are better than he is. And he needs to get the ball in certain spots. And PSG needs to penetrate. And what OL did really well was sort of bog PSG's midfield down. I thought PSG had control of the midfield, but they weren't overrunning OL. It was like OL were bending but not breaking in the midfield so that you never really were able to get the service where you needed to get it. And for Icardi to be effective, he needs to get that service. He needs to be fed. And OL just didn't allow that to happen. They didn't allow a lot of things to happen in that match. But on the flip side, I think the positive, which I think PSG looked really good defensively, and there have been games in the recent past where OL have simply just overwhelmed PSG's back line. Like, I, I, can, I, I, I can picture it in my mind now, you know, Memphis and, uh, and Alrar and all those guys. They, there's, 
been a time where, you know, when Fakir was on the team, where it didn't seem like PSG could keep up with Leon. And I think this was different. I thought PSG stalemated them. And Leon weren't very effective going forward. So I, I thought that was a good sign. And I think the best sign is that you have someone in Kaylor Navas who, in a shootout, in a big match, can come up with the necessary save to win it for you. Like, PSG haven't had that in ever. So, like, this is a first. So if PSG can keep it close against Atalanta, maybe it goes penalty shootout, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's late in the game, and you need that save, Navas can make it. And you just feel more confident with him there than you do, you know, a 40-year-old Buffon or Alphonse Ariola or Kevin Trapp or Salvatore Sirigu. Like, you definitely know that you have a capable, really great goaltender, and I think that's uh, assuring. And I think the back line looked good. I think you talk about the... Uh, you talk about the free kicks, the the corners and the set pieces that PSG are struggling on. I think part of that is a couple. It's a couple things. One, when Thiago Silva plays, he's never he, he's good on set pieces, but I think he's older now. And if you have someone that's bigger than him that can sort of boss him around a little bit, you kind of have that problem where a guy can get on top of him and get a header through. And the other the other thing is. They've never defended from the right back position. So you're talking about that back post run. The one back post run you saw in that match was the one where um, I think it was in the extra time. Was it Corne or was it? No, it was. Uh, it was Triori, somebody where they got that volley off the off the corner and they missed it wide, but they had that wide open volley. You remember that? Yeah, I said yes. Oh, I didn't hear you there. Oh, so you did. Part of that was because Tilo Care didn't know where the ball was and he didn't know where his guy was. So, you know, Munier didn't defend those well, and Care doesn't seem like he's defending them well either. So, you know, I, I'm a little, I, I'm concerned about that. I don't know. If there's much you can do about that now. You just kind of hope that PSG can survive it more or less. I do so, have, yeah. I have one more concern, I think. And it's it's not a concern because it's all the time. It's like, I always say it's a concern. I'm always nervous. But then in the big moments, he always shows up kind of when I need him to. Um, is sometimes Kempembe on the ball scares me a little bit. And he's, I have faith in him. But sometimes I think he likes to get too cute with the ball especially yeah. when he's being when he's being pressed and i think it was the ol game it might have been once or t- once in the uh in this um the set at the end game also but it was definitely once in the ol match where he like t- actually twice where he kind of got dispossessed or lost the ball he was trying to go behind the back real quick when someone pressed him and he almost opened up an opportunity um it happened in dortmund one time as well um so i think sometimes he thinks he's better on the ball than he actually is um and i know Listen, I'm a big Kempembe fan, um, but he just has to clean that up because a team like, you know, that's coming up in a couple of days will definitely make us pay for a mistake like that. And that's something that we really can't afford. Um, but that was really, you know, my only my only takeaways from that. But listen, again, you know, like I said before, another cup on the line, more hardware added to the showcase. Um, you grind it out, defensive win. That's something that you can build confidence off of because they're going to have to play, especially with the injuries we have. You know, they're definitely going to have to lock up from a defensive standpoint. Yeah, and it, with Kimpembe, it's like, yeah, he gets too cute. But, you know, I think he's he, he's a little more in control than he was. I think, you know, in years past, he's been way worse about that. But, yeah, PSG have always struggled when they've gotten pressed in their own end, so it's not anything new. But let, let's say they play... Paredes, Gouye, Marquinhos, that'll be interesting. I think they can help out with that. And obviously, then you'd have Silva. and I think they're going to try to get all three of them on the field for I this think- match regardless. So it's just a matter of, you know, Verratti goes out and Paredes comes in. 
Although that that's interesting because that's not a very up that's that team's going to struggle offensively. Yep. Like especially if Mbappe's not there, it's going to struggle mightily offensively. And you saw from the from the OL game, uh, Marco Verratti was our best player. Like we we can sort of transition into Atlanta now as we kind of get to the fifty minute mark. Oh, Verratti was our best player against OL. Like he was just by far and away he he looked like the best midfielder in the world for the, you know it, during that hundred and twenty minutes. And losing him hurts. It does because it, you lose that sort of spark and it makes you have to be more system oriented you're not going to get that individual brilliance but Paredes will work Gouye will obviously work hard and Marquinhos will work hard so it's not like you're going to have a midfield that's going to get overrun like those guys will work hard and it'll be a much more defensive look and then you just kind of have to figure out what your front three is going to look like because I think you know you know what let's say eight Nine of the nine of the eleven starters are, are pretty much guaranteed at this point. No, I was saying it really depends on like the type of formation that Tuchel tries to go with. Um, it's going to be if he goes to four three three, your front three is probably going to be Neymar on the left, Icardi up front. I'm assuming Sarabia on the right, is what my gut tells me. Um, the middle is where it gets is really right where the, the game is going to be really focused because without Verratti, you miss someone that's able to kind of put in that killer pass now obviously Paredes can do it but if you're going to play Marquinhos and you know Gay in the center those are two individuals that can't one unlock a defense and they don't really offer much from a passing perspective so then especially when we're getting pressed super heavy you're heavily relying on Leandro Paredes to kind of get us out of trouble or kind of you know give us a pass to unlock the defense which is something we're going to have to get around but you know, I think you. Yeah. Kind of, if Roddy's not there, I think you kind of have to play Marquinhos in the center. And I was thinking about this today. Um, you know, going back to the Manchester United game, the first game we had, where you had Marquinhos kind of man mark um, Pogba out of the game. I mean, Tuchel could decide to go with something similar. I mean, Papu Gomez is a phenomenal midfielder. He just won midfielder of the year in Syria. He kind of makes that team tick. So if there's a way to take him out of the game. Um, you know, maybe kind of running a similar tactic is something that Tuchel's thinking about. Like, hey, listen, Marquinhos, you're going to play in the middle, and you just need to negate this guy from the game entirely. You know what I yeah, mean? You're just going to follow him everywhere. Yeah, I think you could do that. I, I think you could do that with uh, Gouye as well if you if you wanted to. If you think that Marquinhos can maybe give you a little more in the passing. I think if we're ranking them as passers, I think Paredes is one, Marquinhos is two, and Gouye is three. I'd so agree. if you, if you want to keep Marquinhos <clears throat> more free to pass in that situation, maybe you have Gouye do it, which is a possibility. But I like that. I like. I think the key is going to be defensively. They're going to have to be really sound. And I think Neymar can get you a goal. I think Neymar can get you a goal if you get lucky. Icardi can get you a goal. Like they're going to score. I think. Atalanta's not a dominant defensive team. PSG, even without Mbappe, I think can score a goal or two. Now, if Mbappe is there, I think it opens up the opportunity to blow him out. Because if you get on, if you get on him early and Mbappe's running on him, I don't think that, um, I don't think that they have an answer for that. But you know, if Mbappe's not playing, you're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to figure out a way defensively to keep them in check, and that. As much as Gomez is the, I think, the midfield engine for them, I agree with that, I think Duven Zapata is the key to the team. I think what he is able to do with his hold-up play allows those smaller Atalanta midfielders and wingers to run off of that, and it allows them to play that, like, ticky-tack of passing game that they like in the box. Like, yeah. anytime I see Atalanta, it's like, they'll make those... They're not fast... They're not particularly, they don't, they, they score basically the way Barcelona scores in this sense. The one twos. Like, the one twos. A lot of one twos. And Zapata is so good at that hold up play that you need Kimpembe there to body him. Like, I think that's part of it. I think Kimpembe just has to stick to him and let Silva sort of control things in the back. But Kimpembe's got to be. I, I would almost think to man mark him and just have Kimpe, the way Kimpembe did to 
to Halan and just just try to be physical with him the whole time and not let him get in position where he can play those one twos and then flood your midfield, try to take Gomez out by just throwing bodies at him and then try to get Bernat, you know, allow it so that you can get Juan Bernat down the left side. You let Neymar pinch in. So it's more like a four, two, three, one in that sense, or like a three, 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 one, I guess would, cause at that point, you know, care is sort of like a pseudo center back right back anyway. And the way they can do it is that they sort of shift them over so that care doesn't have to get forward. Like you saw in that OL game, the pro- one of the problems was Mitchell Bacher, I think, is a really solid defensive left back right now. He's not making those runs. So he, you're, you're not getting that width. So if Bernat can give them width and Neymar can kind of be freed up a little bit to do more Neymar things and not have to be on the wing and give them depth, I think that'll work. And I think you can get a goal or two and then hold on defensively. I think that's how they're going to have to do this. I don't think they're going to – they can't blow them out without Mbappe. It's just they don't have the offensive juice to do it. So there would there really would have to focus on getting a goal, maybe a set piece, maybe, you know, maybe a, a counter off the run of play, and then really be – Solid defensively. Like, they, they're going to have to, you know, it's not impossible. I think they clearly can defend this team. I don't think it's one of those things where PSG are going to be overwhelmed by Atalanta, you know, by their physicality and speed. I think PSG, I think this is, without those, you know, Verratti and Mbappe, I think this game becomes more even. But I still give yeah, a slight edge to PSG they're... because I think PSG are, def- are good enough defensively right now where they can s- take the hits. And they can sort of survive it. That's that's my that's my thought, you know, sort of first blush on this. Yeah, I think I agree. I think from like a tactical standpoint, there's a lot of options out there, right? You can you can you can go the four three three, the more defensive. Um, you can go with like, um, you can go with the four a four two three one and kind of let Neymar play in like that number ten behind Icardi and kind of put Saravia and Draxler or um, someone else, you know, in, in front of him. Um, or do you stick to, you know, what we've been playing, you know, the four, four, two and just kind of um, put maybe Chupo up front and Sarabi on the wing, you know, give, giving credit, you know, um, to Ali tactics on Twitter. I, I actually, he wrote a great article recently about, you know, I'm a, I loved the tactical side of the game and he wrote an article about, you know, kind of how, um, Tuchel can set up, and maybe that's maybe that's the option, right? A four four two um, with Neymar on the left, Sarabi on the right, um, Chupo up there. Chupo has been playing well, you know. Um, obviously, I never really expected me to say, hey, in a big Champions League game, I would rely on him, but maybe maybe that's also what Icardi could use, right? Someone to play a quick one two, someone he can play off of up there, where they can kind of exchange passes and also, you know, have Neymar and Sarabi creating with and those those low through balls or low crosses you know on the, on the wings and then in the defensive Neymar has shown that he's willing to drop back we know Sarabi is as well so then when we on the defensive they drop back and we can kind of form those two layers right there to make things really difficult for for Atalanta um I don't know I, I feel like the 442 is just something where you know Tuchel knows the team knows that they're comfortable playing that so maybe he doesn't want to get too crafty but what, what I will say is um, we've seen it, right? Tuchel is not a prisoner to the system. He is okay with changing things up. And that is something that, you know, um, Ali Tactics said as well. You know, we, he has options in his repertoire that he can use. Um, but what it, what's it going to be? And we won't know until until they step on the field that day. But even without Verratti, without Neymar, I mean, without Mbappe, there are options, right? And that, that's the beautiful yeah. thing about having a deep bench is that we do have options. Um, but listen, I think... Um, Neymar's going to need to play big. Um, yeah. Icardi is going to need to step out of his shell a little bit. You know, we've, we praised Sarabia all season for, you know, maybe being the best transfer pickup that we've had this season. Um, he's going to need to play big. And, you know, Ghana Gay is going to need to play big. Listen, there's been some talk recently about, you know, since he, he's come back from the break where he hasn't kind of been in his best form. Uh, I know you mentioned, you know, he's someone that relies off of being, you know, in his in his best form and being physically fit and all that stuff to play the game that he likes to play. Well, 
in order for us to be successful, to make things a lot easier for the team, you know, we're going to need to see that that player that we saw against Real Madrid, you know, in the first game of the group stage. Uh, you know, that's going to be he's definitely going to be an integral part because we're also in a position now where with Ferrati gone, I've always said, oh, well, you know, if Gay's having one of those games where he's not really making an impact where he's not passing well or doing X, Y, and Z, we have the ability to bring him off and bring someone else on. We're, we're running relatively thin here. So, you know, he's really going to have to step up and kind of hold his own weight in this game. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think the problem with the 4-4-2 is that I just, I, I don't think you can afford to be outnumbered in the midfield against Atalanta. I, I just don't think you can have, I think you need three pure midfielders out there, or at least three guys who can act like mid. Like Marquinhos is not a pure midfielder, but he's good enough. He's athletic enough where he can basically play like a six, and he can he can actually he's he's better at that position than I ever thought he'd be. So you know he can kind of work there. And it's like if you just have like Paredes and Marquinhos, or like Guye and Paredes, I think that midfield gets overrun. I think you just need bodies that can you can keep in front of Atalanta and not allow them to sort of get into rhythm. Like you need to break their rhythm up. And I just, I don't want to be in a situation where we're behind, you know, I don't want to be in a position where our midfield is just getting overrun. Like that's what I'm worried about. If they go to a four, four, two, if they stay with the, they do that four, three, three, they basically did against um, Leon at the start. I think that's kind of where you have to go. I don't think they have a better option than that. My concern is that Sarabia is, I don't think he can make those runs that Neymar needs him to make. So that that's kind of concerning. I think they're going to have to really find a way to get Neymar in the middle, running at them, running at the at Atlanta defense, as opposed to him sort of sitting and trying to make passes over the top, which is what he can do when Mbappe's in there. It, it, it makes Neymar's game easier. Neymar's going to have to work as hard as he's ever worked in a match, in this match. Because he's going to need to create for guys that you know, he's going to have to create a lot of chances or as many chances as he can in a situation like this, because they're going to need to, they're not going to, it's not going to be a situation where they have three chances and they score on three of them. They're going to need to generate offense and it's going to have to be sort of artificial. And if Neymar can get in space, which is what I think Bernard will help him do then we're going to have a good chance of being able to score a couple of goals. So at the end of the day, final, you know, this will be the last time I, I talk before <laughs> on a podcast before this match. I'll make my prediction. I don't like doing it, but I'll do it anyway. I think that I think it's going to be two, one going one way or the other. I, even though today was a pretty bad day to, to sort of reinforce this, but I think PSG know that this is their chance. And I think regardless of who's on the field, I think they're going to work their ass off and I think they're going to win. I, like I know that. I like nothing, that. nothing that I've said maybe speaks to that, but I think they're going to win. I think that they know that, if they can just get this win, if they can work hard and they can throw their body at it defensively, you'll you'll get maybe you'll get even Mbappe for a few minutes in the game. Maybe Verratti does play a few minutes or he starts, but you'll definitely know that those guys will be healthy for the next semifinal match. And they're all going to be in Lisbon. They're not going to want to leave. They're going to want to finish this. So I think the team in general. I think you're going to see them pull this out. I don't think it's going to be pretty. I think it's going to be an ugly match. But 2 nothing, 2-1, I think PSG find a way. Oh, I don't want to do this. Um, no, nobody wants to do that. Nobody yeah, wants to do I, um, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to stick with my prediction. I think, um, listen, I think PSG have game changers on the pitch. Um, and in Champions League games and games like this, one-off games, game changers make the difference. And I think Neymar is a game changer. I think, you know, the majority of teams in the world, you know, regardless of the the BS he gets and how people talk about him, the majority of teams in the world will would want Neymar, you know, on their team with the game on the line potentially. So um, 
I don't want to put a score on it. I don't have an idea. I think I was thinking the two one kind of thing you, that you were thinking. Um, th- this is a weird one because I feel like it's kind of like the Dortmund where you know everyone was like, oh, this is going to be a, a high scoring game. Where I feel like maybe it won't. I think both teams will take this kind of conservatively and play a more defensive game. I think Atalanta will realize PSG's strengths and they won't play. They won't throw every the kitchen sink forward as they usually do. Um, they'll kind of sit back a little bit. I could be completely wrong on that, you know. Um, yeah. I'm open to changing my my opinion on that, so I'll, I'll get back to you. But, um, but yeah, I, th- I think PSG pull it out at the end of the day. Um, I do not think Mbappe will start. Um, I think my gut tells me that he will be available on the bench in case it's like a you know Tuchel needs to kind of break the emergency glass and and put him out i think you know if psg get an early lead or maybe go up 2 nil that would be great i think that's an opportunity for him not to even play mbappe and just let him rest without risking injury um i know i know ed you know you and ed had talked on twitter i think i saw about um ed had made comments in regards to you know i want to see these guys play it's just it, it's an ankle so and so played on an ankle and i you know i get it soccer is a little bit different um and i don't know how i feel as much as I want to see Mbappe play and he changes our game so much, what would you rather have, you know, him potentially sit out and say, Hey, listen, guys handle this. I'll be back next round or him come out and play, help us win. And then something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, and then he's out for the rest of the tournament. You know what I mean? So that's I want them to long handle com- That's a longer conversation than we have time for. I think it's a philosophical yeah. one. It depends how you view sports. Yeah. My thing is if he's capable, first of all, here's my thing with both of them. I think they should both be on the bench. I think you I have five subs. There's no reason not to have them on the bench. You have plenty of subs. You're not going to use them all. Just let them be on the bench. And if they're, you know, even if they're not completely ready, and if you fall behind to Atlanta, you know, the next meaningful game Killian Mbappe would play anyway would be October. So, you know, it may be worth it at that point. It's a Champions League. It's an opportunity well, to, that to I win do, that trophy. That I do agree with. I think, listen, if, if if your name's on the team sheet and you're on the bench, then if he needs to call on your name, then you should be yeah. ready and fit to I go. Think and I, be on I, the team. I think you'll be on the team. I think you'll be on the bench. I think he, and I do I agree. Think they're gonna, I think he's going to be on the bench. Barati's I, a little trickier. We'll see how that goes. It, it's a... It's a calf bruise, so you could play if it's if it's a calf bruise, you can play through that. It's just a matter of if there's sort of a muscle pull or a tear. I don't think there's a tear. It doesn't seem like it. But you know, if you know, it depends. Muscle pull, you can you could put heat on that and you can maybe gut it out. But you know, we'll see. We're not doctors. But yeah. Hopefully but, um... the next time, you know, we have hopefully they can do it. I, I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not giving up faith on this team. I think, uh, you know, it's not, I'm not going to say my famous 2% chance of winning. I think it's more like, I think it's more like 55% chance of winning 56% chance, something like that. No. Yeah. I think without the team with, with with what we have, I think um, I'm still leaning towards a win. Um, I have faith. Um, I like our chances and you know what? I, I also think obviously outside of the Manchester United second leg, um, hate to bring that up, but when we have had a big game, for the most part, um, you know, in these situations where we think, you know, hey, we're missing certain players, uh, Tuchel sometimes decides to bring out a, a master class from a, tacti- from a tactical standpoint. So, um, yeah. listen, he, he is one coach where I will say, you know, sometimes he overthinks things too much when we have everybody, um, but when we are down, he definitely gets creative and kind of throws something different out. We saw it against Dortmund's second leg. We saw it against Real Madrid in the, the first game of the group stage. We saw it against Liverpool, you know, in, in Paris. So, um, listen, for some of his faults, when it comes to the tactical side of the game, um, you know, he is someone that I, I do have some faith in, at least from that standpoint. So I'm going to go PSG win, and, um, you know, we're having a happy conversation, hopefully getting ready for either Leipzig or at, at Let It Go with hopefully a fresher squad with individuals returning from injury. I agree. So, yeah, um, Ty, this was a good first time around. Um, how can people find you uh, on the social media? Yeah, for sure. Um, you can find me on Twitter at my handle, which is at Ty Pound Sign. Um, yeah, that's that's usually where I'm talking PSG for the most part. So, 
um, you know, feel free to follow me and look forward to speaking to you guys again, man. Mark, it's been a blast. Appreciate it. Yep, man. Um, for for my uh, for my new Twitter account, because I decided that, um, well, for multiple reasons, I won't get into now. But I think sometimes it's good to have a Twitter refresh. I had that for a while, so I retired Mark Damon one. It is now Mark Damon nine. So if you're looking for me on Twitter, this is going to be a specifically PSG centric account. Not just PSG, uh, all sports, but it's going to be. PSG centric with my other sports interests involved as well, but no politics, no, none of my other personal grievances or any of that, just straight up, you know, PSG it's set up for that reason. Follow me at PSG. Sorry. Follow me at Mark Damon nine, my new Twitter account. Uh, see how long it'll get me to get back up to what I had. I don't, doesn't really matter. It's not the point, but, um, yeah, sometimes you need a refresher, so that was my refresher. Um, yeah, so new Twitter, Mark Damon Nine. I keep saying it. <laughs> Make sure everyone gets the picture. Um, all right, so for Todd, this has been BSG Talk contributor Mark Damon saying au revoir for now.